Hey, hey, you're back in the garage with Easy Jeezy. You gonna be on the camera? You gonna be on the camera this time? You wanna be a star? Huh? Yeah. You're back in the garage with Easy and Jeezy. And uh, she's been sleeping all day. She doesn't know how to play with dog toys. So now she wants to play with me. And I've got to get a video up by tomorrow sometime. Today's Thursday and I'm trying to get one up on Fridays. So at any rate, on that last video when we attacked Heartbreak Hill, there was a, so a period of time that I did a tune-up. There was a couple days in between, and I did the ultimate thing that you're not supposed to do when troubleshooting is I made more than one change at a time. And I was, I'm trying to sort out this little stumble. And even though I've made a great improvement on the things that I found and did, I still am having... <clears throat> A little, it, it's less than perfect. So, what can I say? I decided to uh, exercise my seat of the pants meter and take the Baja up on the hill because last summer, uh, yeah, almost a year ago, I had done that. I never posted, I didn't have my camera with me. I hadn't planned on it. It was just some, one day I was out for a drive and I decided to go up there and it was before the dog and all that sort of thing. So I thought I'd take the dog and go back and you'll see the results of that in this video today. And I, uh, a lot of rambling <clears throat> off the bench. I was almost tempted to just make this another carburetor video, but I've got so many of those up as it is. But at any rate, I know I've got some folks that uh, just joy, enjoy it for the entertainment aspect of it. And for those new to my channel, there might be a few little gold nuggets in there that might help you solve your problems. So stay tuned. I thought, just for comparison's sake, we'd hop in the Baja and go over here to Heartbreak Hill. Now, of course, this is a little heavier car, and it's got a little taller tires on the back. It's got 30-inch tall tires that weigh on the rims. The wheel and the tire is 57 pounds, and we'll kind of get a comparison, and then maybe we'll go back to the shop and we'll talk about some of the things I did on the tune-up and why because it did seem to have an effect. I guess I picked the wrong day guys. Oh, they're doing road work on Heartbreak Hill. We got flagmen out on the road and everything. Oh, well that's a bummer. Oh well, out for a putt anyhow, right? Dog on it. Son of a gun. Well, it's kind of surprising for as overcast as it is to to be able to see that far. Are you disappointed, Easy? Hey, hey, what do you think? You think it's rude of those guys to come up here and mess up our ride? <laughs> well, we'll go back to the shop and uh, have a little talk about it. Yeah, here's our starting point. So, I like to hit that at a certain speed. <laughs> Good thing I didn't come around that corner very fast, huh? This guy looks like a, he's in a hurry. <laughs> I gotta go! Okay, there's many things, many variables, and this is the curse of dual carbs. Dual carbs is the best thing you can do, in my opinion, to get more power from one of these boxer motors. You have shorter intake manifolds, you don't have that manifold heat issue, um, you, it, the throttle response is better, 
so on and so forth. But uh, if you have sloppy linkage, if you have worn ball joints, if you have the angles, the geometry, all this stuff is movable. And it needs to be that way. But if you don't set it up correctly the first time, if you do it correctly the first time, you won't have to mess with them too much. Then the only thing you have to deal with is a clogged jet or something along that line. And it depends on the environment you're in. If you're just driving on pavement streets, you know, you can go a long ways, a long time without having any kinds of problems at all. But when you leave your car sit for months and months on end, and if you have problems with fuel, uh, they have fuel filters and the inlet to the carb and most of us run a fuel filter between the gas tank and the carburetor so <clears throat> but you know stuff happens it happens to all of us and you've all had it involved the problem with this setup is that it's like which one is clogging up which one is a problem if it's a total clog that's pretty simple if it's a partial clog and it can happen now I have these simple dividers you've seen me use these for other projects you could make something you could use plier handles you could use a couple of sticks and a uh, clamp it with a vice grip there's nothing magical these happen to be nice ones and I like them so what I do is I I set the distance where if I go straight in to touch the shaft from center to center it just barely drags just like you're setting your valves okay just barely drags then I go over to the other side and I compare that and I look at oop, let me flip them around here and I get it centered and look at that see where it's uh, it's above the nut instead of below the nut so that's a discrepancy and I've got to correct that. You can move these on the handle. If one gets ahead of the other, you can compensate. You don't want these straight up and down. You want it almost 90 degrees. Now these carburetors work fine up to 5,000 uh, RPM on this one. I had them on my 1800. But this is larger displacement. You're moving more CFM, more air maybe that I've got to figure out where the restriction is if I've if I step down you know I've I've got a somewhat free flowing valve uh, exhaust for a stock valve head these are inch and three eight J tubes and these aren't the inch and a half these are the smaller ones I think these are inch and three eighths as well you want to get the right exhaust header for the type of cylinder. Bigger isn't always better. Of course, running no muffler is always an improvement. Less restriction and less flow. The books say that you need about 24 inches after the head before you get to the collector. This is a crummy collector. This is not what you want for a merged collector and then having a sharp turn like this even though it is larger diameter but we're really restricted because of the body and most of these are made for street cars so it's just a matter of fitting all that stuff in there okay so I have some geometry issues here another thing that I wanted to check is my fuel pressure so I pinched off the line I use an electric fuel pump I have a regulator I put a small gauge in here and it read three pounds exactly what I want for this type of carburetor okay so you these are the things that you need to check because the float level and the drip and all these other issues that people have all play a part in the drivability and performance of your engine this distributor is stopping at 28 degrees 12 degree static 28 is where it stops I'm used to seeing 34 on the older 009s I gotta double check that but <clears throat> thought I'd throw that in there so you got timing you got exhaust you got your your head itself the the compression ratio the venturi in your carburetor there's 
there seems to me there's a restriction someplace. There's something holding me back. Or the profile of that camshaft. Even though the cam isn't going flat, as far as I know, it might not be ground. It might not be the right choice of camshaft for this combination. Okay? It's sad but true. And as much trouble as I had, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. But before it's very difficult, you'd have to assemble your, most of your engine to get to the camshaft to replace it. That's a couple hundred bucks for a cam and lifters. Then you have to go through the whole routine again. But um, cam break in and so forth. But it's a possibility when you make these choices, you've got to take all of those things into consideration. The size, the displacement, the compression, the camshaft profile, carburetors, what kind of flow you got in your heads, in your Venturis, your choice of these things. If you get any one of those things screwed up, it'll run. That's the amazing things about these engines. They'll, you could put a... You could put that 30 pick one on here and it would probably start and run. But would you be happy driving it that way? No. And would you be getting a full performance out of it? No. And are we asking for maximum horsepower out of this? No. Most of the time horsepower comes with RPM. If you watch any video stuff on YouTube, Engine Masters with Motor Trend, I love watching those dynos <clears throat> runs and stuff because they, they have the graphs and they can show where's the torque, where's the peak horsepower. It's always all the improvements that they make, turbocharging, supercharging, multi-carburetors, changing manifolds and camshafts. What it does is it, it allows it to get more RPM and you get higher horsepower, but it's all up high. If you're going for maximum, if you want a 700 horsepower engine, it might not run the way you want going from stoplight to stoplight especially if it's a standard transmission and you got a heavy enough clutch to uh, hold that kind of power <laughs> okay so now <clears throat> let's move over to my test bench um, you want to be comfortable want to get some good lighting you want to get some tunes on and uh, you want to uh, enjoy this process you don't want to be struggling with it laying in the dirt and stuff <clears throat> I used to put my carburetors cockeyed in the vents and gently hold them and stand on a step stool so that I could look down and see inside and I had this old Magnum 44 head that is now junk because that's the one that lost the valve guide and I found that hey I've got my table here I can just sit down <laughs> and I can enjoy this process and what I did was take this carburetor and I held it in my hand and I connected it to the fuel line in the normal spot I put a little cap on this right here and I let it run and I let it fill and I operated the the throttle until I saw the acceler pumps squirting God, can't talk the accelerator pumps squirting and it was a nice smooth flow and these carburetors were on the 2110 before. And I also had these on the Sandrail with the 2276. And they have all the stock jet sizes and so forth. What I've done is set this up approximately level. And I'll start taking it apart. And I want to see when I lift the float assembly out, I've had these things for enough years I know where I want to see that gasoline level in that float. There's a step in Delorto carburetors and I like it just over that step. That's what seems to be the the perfect level for the jets that I use and my driving habits. Okay so I'm gonna put you on the stand and we'll start taking some things off here. Um, it's been a while but I want to do the, I have a pair of these 40s. I want to do the 36s and set those aside because those will probably go back on the 1800 here in a few weeks uh, once I get that bad cylinder square. Uh, 
get your tools out, get new screwdrivers with good tips on them, and you don't have to be super strong, and you don't have to... Th these 40 carburetors were... I bought in a bucket at a, uh, a flea market, and a lot of this stuff was stripped. I don't know how or why, what kind of insanity causes people to bear down on things like this you know if you've got seepage and your carbs are leaking gas bearing down on the screws is probably not going to solve it you need to replace the gasket or the seal not just keep tightening things this and you know when when i was in high school in the 60s we had automotive shop class they had a V8 engine, we had a six-cylinder engine, we had a, a transmission, and you took it apart. You got a, you partnered up, it was kind of like a lab, and you partnered up with another student, and you took, took it all apart. And you measured things, and you showed the teacher that you could measure things and do different things. And... Then you put it back together and you put it on the engine stand and if you wanted a passing grade it better start and run. <laughs> and it was it's not like we changed anything, but you got familiar with with the parts and, and how everything worked. Now these are the main jets, the main jet stacks, and it's a good idea whenever you're into these things to uh, make sure they're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> and you're really taking a chance when you buy used equipment. You don't know if somebody's put a, a drill down there. And these are for younger eyes. One. <laughs> oh my gosh. 140. 140. And I've got the book. I don't rely on memory because I have so many different products it's easy to get confused if you just have one car you memorize this stuff right okay for a 40 a 140 main jet is correct ding 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 60 idle jet accelerator pump jet is 35 that's the smallest pump jet the 36 takes a 50, the 45 and 48 take 55s. Isn't that interesting? Um, the third, the 36 and 40s they have a 60 idle jet, and the 45 and 48s have a 70 idle jet, and that's for a dual carburetor setup. So, is it a wonder that they don't get as good a gas mileage, and they? They run so fantastic at wide open throttle. <laughs> so, you really want to be careful on these gaskets. Don't tear them if you're going to reuse them. And they are expensive. And it just makes you want to cry when one of them tears. Um, these aren't like the paper ones. These are almost like a, a... This is a homemade one. That's what that is. Look at it. I made that. <laughs> I went to Ace Hardware and they have that rolled up gasket material. There it is, right there, baby. Oh man. That's. <laughs> you do what you gotta do. Okay. I'm gonna check this one. The, the top section is your emulsion tube. These are a 180. The. The smaller the number, the richer you make it. It lets air into that. The higher the number, the leaner it makes it. <coughs> See, I'm talking too loud. I'm shouting. And that aggravates this cough of mine. And I've been talking a lot today. 140. Woohoo! Okay. The difference here, and I like using screwdrivers with long shanks because it helps you with your alignment. You can align it better. You get it in to the slot straight and you do less damage. 
Boy, some of this stuff, you, you see it all choked up. These are the babies that always get clogged up. And you'll see the, the gas in there. You want to check any of these O-rings. If they're old and cracked and this ethanol fuel, the alcohol and the fuel, is such a good solvent that it takes whatever that petroleum product is that's in rubber that keeps it elastic, it, it washes it away and then they dry out. So sometimes just sitting around, they still will give you trouble. I have a special screwdriver that I like to have. This is kind of neat, sitting on a chair. <laughs> I call this a split tail screwdriver. It's uh, for flat screws and when you spread it apart it gets thicker and when you're working in a car and you can't have big clumsy fingers you can lift stuff out with it or of course you could take some needle nose and you could carefully pick it out whatever trips your trigger and this is oh that's interesting this is a 62 did I say 60 on that other one no this is a 62 see the book calls for 60 that's interesting now since that just came up I'm gonna count my turns on my needle idle needle screws here one half one one half two two and a quarter usually these things are three and a half one half one one and a half two and a quarter I'll try the other one one half one one and a half two and a quarter one half one one and a half two and a quarter that's good to know see I forgot that so it's a good thing that I'm going through this and scoping it out before I put it on the new engine hmm. <laughs> There's lock washers in here. Um, it's really best to take it off of the car. And when you have these off of the car, that's a good time to pull your spark plugs and check them because you have easier access than by these manifolds and the tin that's in there. And if you want to do a compression check, I usually do it with the carburetor off of the head where you just got a couple of holes there. And this 2110, for somebody who's just dropping in, tested 148 pounds on cylinders 1, 2, and 4. Now, be extremely careful when you lift this top because there's another one of those gaskets there. And if you want to take your float off, that's how you tear things. It'll get hung up on screw threads or stick to the body. Some people put a little bit of Vaseline around or you can put some light grease or something in there. I don't necessarily like to do that. And while I'm looking at this, I'm going to look across the room, <laughs> hopefully, and I want to see, oh, I got the shakes. I didn't have lunch. The top of this is parallel with the top of the aluminum. And when the float is falling down, the bottom of the float is parallel with the top of the, the bottom of this base. Okay? And there is an adjustment in here. And don't just try to reach in there and bend it. You do it the hard way and take the screw out and disassemble it and check it out and it's not where there's a the needle you can't see it the needle has a, a pin coming out of it and 
it's not when that part goes up and down and once once it comes it's the now I've made contact right here and it'll go a little bit further to be really truthful with you I've had them less than perfect and they worked fine now I'm gonna set it on a, this container so it's supported but it's not the weight of this isn't on the float be, you're bouncing around in the car I know okay now <laughs> it's right on the shelf baby right where I like it okay so what have we learned <laughs> I don't know if I can the glare See, this is what I call the shelf, right over here on this right-hand side. And I like it where the fuel is just on top of that shelf. That seems to be the sweet spot. Now, <clears throat> let's cover a couple things while we're in here. Um, we talk about leaks and problems and so on and so forth. Uh, that screw that's at the bottom, right there in the center, that is a check valve for your accelerator pump. That's where it sucks fuel in. And because on these Delortos, that's relatively at the bottom of the float bowl, on a Weber, that bypass valve screws in, but it sits not on the bottom like this. It kind of takes it from the side, not from the bottom. And what has a tendency to happen on these type of setups is that the accelerator pump cavity becomes the trash can. You'll take your accelerator pump off or your accelerator pump will quit working because there's so much trash in there it, it doesn't allow the diaphragm to move back and forth. And so you take these screws out and be sure if you're doing this out in the road or on the, on the dunes that you put a tarp or something down on the ground it's not that far down and just go ahead and if you drop any of these screws or washers and stuff you, you it, it's not going to disappear this distance on this accelerator pump screw is telling me that there's a lot of squirt going in to those cylinders if the farther out it is, the less it activates the diaphragm. And the book calls out a specification in cc's to as to what a squirt should be. But it's a pretty elaborate setup, and I've never figured it out. And it's like, if it doesn't backfire through the carburetor, and it doesn't have black smoke coming out the exhaust, I kind of play with this till I find that happy spot. Now these parts will wear out. The pivot point in the back, this hole will get bigger and when you mash on the throttle suddenly there's no way that that fuel is going to be pushed out that little tiny hole that quickly. And that's the idea of the spring here. When you push down, just barely push down you're coming to a little hill or you want to keep the same distance with the car in front of you fuel doesn't squirt out it goes back into the float chamber there and if you push on it quickly that's when you need the extra fuel and you get the squirt I hope that makes sense to somebody um, what else can I show you while we're here under these screws is there's a there's a weight and a ball that's the check valve. What else? There was something I wanted to show you. You can see, you know, you loosen these to pull these upper. Um, these are the main jet venturis. This is where fuel goes down for your mains, right here. At a certain uh, airflow, it starts drawing. This creates a vacuum here and it starts pulling fuel in and that's how you size that main jet that's why you have the different sizes as to when that happens and to how much that happens then your venturis are below that and those are replaceable now what do I want to show you these little holes right here you have them on Weber's and you have them on these if you get what they call an update kit you put the little lead plug you put it in that hole 
and instead of having a short jet stack, you have a tall jet stack. And sometimes it's possible you keep pulling your uh, idle jets out and blowing through them and checking and it's like, why is this thing snapping and popping and it won't idle smoothly? Well, the, the, it rarely happens. It rarely happens. But it's possible that a, a grain of sand or something can get lodged in here. And this is how particles can get in here. Small particles. You know what the dirt and sludge is that you see in carburetors. That, that stuff can go down this vent hole into that stack and create a blockage here. If this is blocked completely, it won't allow flow. If you have a soft drink and a glass and a cup and you have a straw in there and you hold your finger over the straw and lift it up, the fuel stays in the straw until you pull your finger off, right? That's the same thing that happens here. If this isn't open and free, then you could have a mysterious uh, idle issue on one cylinder and a popping sound. And you've got one for each, each jet stack. Now, sometimes these things are self-cleaning. You have the, the top that goes in here and, and all this stuff, and it, when it backfires and snorts, that's a backfire from clear into the intake manifold. And sometimes if the throttle is partly open, you'll get back pressure. That's why on some cars that are badly out of tune, you'll have carbon and stuff higher up into the carburetor area. And it's like, why is this all black? Where does this junk come from, you know? Um, and and that's, that's one of the things. Sometimes that backfire will actually dislodge that piece of blockage, whatever it is in there. And then it's floating around. On, on the base and at a perfect inopportune time when you hit a bump it it gets bounced around it's just like playing putt-putt golf so let's just sort of the gasket's still there on the bottom I want you to see this because I think it's I think it's important I know my float level is right now okay you see that little spot it's like having a, a guide telling the your your main jet goes down here your idle jet goes here now you've got see, see you've got a trough here it's kind of like saying come on over here go down this hole flush this down this toilet you know and let's just see now uh, the screws are in the way but you can see the the general idea you've got this toilet bowl that you're forming here and then you've got those passages. They've come out now recently with the update kit for um, Weber carburetors as well. But I want to tell you the update kit, they are they do away with this and they do away with your Venturi. And the, the, the thing is they're supposed to create a, a, a less of an obstruction so you get more airflow. These little jet stacks I've got some. Let me show you. Let me see if I can find them real quick. Okay, this is your idle jet holder and your idle jet's right in the end. You're replacing this upper section. <laughs> Aha! With this device here. See how big that is? And it's got your hole at the bottom. See? Pretty cool, isn't it? Now, I don't see these being sold separately and for quite a few years no, nobody had anything for the Weber carburetors because they're trying to sell you fuel injection. A lot of people just weren't spending time trying to upgrade and improve carburation because they were trying to push people towards fuel injection. And fuel injection is really the way to go. But it's expensive and it's more complex. And some people just like a traditional carburetor that if you're in a part of the country where this stuff isn't available, you can take things apart and clean them and do things uh, like this, like we're doing today, easier, easier. It's not impossible to do. See, there's nothing on the top of this. And it's got all the little holes and, and doodads. And there's the there's the regular jet 
on this side. And so instead of it being in the bottom of the trash can, you've elevated it. But if, you've, if your air cleaners aren't doing their job and you're getting junk past here and there's a lot of air turbulence moving over here and so things are crisscrossing around, you're bouncing around. So there's still, it's just one of the places you got to look for. If you are having problems with getting dirt and stuff in your carburetor, I do not promote putting grease around the base of those and gobbing stuff up, putting sealers and things on there. I just put them on the way they are. There's enough oil in that K&N filter that seems to dribble down in into the groove anyhow. You want to make sure that they're seated fully and that is the problem. Here's my fuel gauge. It's a 0 to 30. Stay on track, Greg. <laughs> okay. What happens is these beautiful looking things, you see how they're so crazy looking? There's no real consist consistency in that shape there. I'm talking right around this flange. That's because your the flange protrudes beyond that edge of the filter. And so you keep tightening on the top of the filter, trying to get this filter to mash down and look flat. And then you start deforming your filter, getting these wrinkles in it and stuff like that. What I did on mine is I would set the filter in its place like this. And I would see, oh, it's it's not clear. It's very tight. It's, can, it's right up against that rubber base. But it's right up against this base. That's what you want to look for. It doesn't matter what it looks like, how ugly it's going to be. You're not going to have a big gaping hole that's going to affect your, your uh, airflow meter. It, but you need to address this. And I've every carb I've ever had, that's been an issue with it. And you can see... It's the same thing with this one here. I had to chew that away. The second part that it creates a problem with is your the edge of the flange here protrudes into this toilet bowl, as we'll call it, and it makes it extra difficult to get these little idle jets up and out because you've got all that extra metal in the way. And you're trying to get your, it falls over, or you're trying to get it with your needle nose, or God help you if you got to get that out of there with your fingertips, and you don't have any tools like a split tail or a needle nose, that'll make you cry. Get a stick and start rubbing and scraping, and you can see that little vent hole right next to it. Um, I'm not putting them in. I don't, I'm not going to need it for this setup, and so I'm not going to bother. I'm going to save those. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to save that. I need to save more stuff. And then I need to know where it is when it's time to find it. I know I got that someplace. Where did I? Head out and have some fun. But wait! There's more! I need a burrito. That's what I need.